So today as we talk about chapter 24, and it titled Nationalism, Revolution, and Dictatorship, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. We're looking at the times particularly between 1919 and 1939, specifically from the end of the First World War to the beginning of the Second World War. So this, you know, again, the themes I want to look at are poverty and subjugation, there's a connection, and poverty and desperation and what happens. So to begin, um, this period after the First World War, uh, we're really looking at uh, a rise of nationalism, and particularly in these areas that we're discussing, in Asia, in Latin America, and in the Middle East. Uh, although the West had emerged from the First World War um, relatively intact, uh, Germany was not invaded and conquered. Um, we don't have uh, sort of the apocalyptic ending that we do with the Second World War with the atomic weapon or the pure destruction of nations. Um, however, uh, Europe's confidence within itself had been undermined. Um, there were true doubts about the survivability or the viability of Western civilization. Um, I, I wrote a paper in grad school on the decline of the practice of Christianity in Europe. And there was a measurable decline in church attendance at this time. Um, now, importantly, these doubts and these economic uncertainties had global repercussions. Um, and the unrest that resulted from the weakness uh, created in the First World War, the power of vacuums um, that had been created, uh, caused uh, a nationalistic fervor uh, among many of these colonies. And so in many cases, in particular, we're looking at Asia, Africa, and Latin America, independent states had begun forming. Uh, many of these had been successful in resisting the West. And um, especially by the time of the Great Depression, uh, many European countries had had to let go of their colonies simply due to a lack of resources. And um, this created a, a power vacuum. Many of these colonies had been impoverished due to centuries of subjugation and uh, with lack of a strong central authority. The um, lack of a government led to a period of anarchy in many cases. Uh, followed by a period of strong leadership, often under dictatorships. Um, but first, the good news. <laughs> That's just a little introduction. Um, we'll begin by talking about the new urban westernized uh, middle class. Now, this first stage in resistance uh, to the West, uh, be it in Asia or in Africa, um, really created a great deal of humiliation among the European powers. There was a great loss of prestige. Europe was in the process of losing many of its colonial possessions. Uh, many of the central powers' colonial possessions had been forcibly taken from them. Now, this is the beginning of the process. The next phase uh, is the process of these former colonies forming nations. Now, um, in many cases, the most vocal uh, critics of imperialism in these colonies, in these former colonies, uh, were individuals who were educated in the West. We'll be talking about Mahatma Gandhi, classic example. Had studied in England, had studied to become a lawyer, and chose to go back to India to practice, only to lead a peaceful revolution. Uh, against the British government. Now, um, in many cases, uh, these westernized intellectuals uh, 
uh, meaning uh, people who had grown up in these colonies like the Congo or um, India or Malaysia or um, Indochina that had been educated in Western schools. Uh, some had even uh, spent a great deal of their lives in Western countries. Uh, many of these spoke English or French or other Western languages, uh, and many even began to adopt uh, the culture of their parent countries. Now, on one hand, many of these people uh, fostered a deep resentment uh, for uh, the traditional ways. Uh, a great example of this would be uh, when Peter the Great was in the process of trying to modernize Russia, he actually uh, instituted a, a beard tax. Uh, it was sort of Russian traditional culture to wear a beard. It was fashionable in that country. Uh, he saw it as un-European, and so he attempted in his own country as the ruler to outlaw the wearing of a beard. Um, he made it uh, difficult to be a, a practicing Jew uh, because he wanted uh, his culture at the time to reflect uh, the Western culture of Europe, which was still predominantly Christian at that time, uh, and so he made it difficult. Now, on the other hand, um, many of these Western-educated colonial subjects uh, resented the way that their people were being treated. Again, Gandhi, classic example. Now, even though these people had um, implemented many aspects of Western culture into their own lives, in practice, they were still being treated as second-class citizens. Now, imagine growing up in a place where you were ruled by a government that was not your own, from a people who lived far away, and that you had no real say in this government, no vote, no freedom to voice your discontent, and then you got to go live somewhere else, somewhere far more advanced somewhere you considered more enlightened, but you looked different than these people. Your accent was different. You dressed differently. But over time, you learned how to fit in. You made friends among these people. Maybe you started a family there. Maybe you actually practiced and lived for a period of time in this advanced civilization. And then you began to feel homesick. So you go home and see your family and you realize that you've betrayed your own people. Maybe not in truth, but the feeling of betrayal was there. Because the reality is that life is better in the parent country than it was in the colony. There was no real economic equality. You see, true equality was lacking. Now, among the middle classes, those who actually had this opportunity to go to the parent countries, um, life was not as bad. But what I'm discussing are the lives of the majority of people living in these colonies uh, that had to work in menial jobs, that had to live in poverty. Typically, these were the best jobs they could get. And after a time, these people began to notice that they were being paid less than Europeans, even if they were doing the same work. Inferiority was not only conveyed through income, but also in culture. 
Europeans living in these colonies formed whites only clubs. And um, it was not uncommon for them to address the indigenous peoples in very informal manners. For example, instead of, um, I actually have a really th thick southern accent, um, and I like to use slang, especially when I'm talking to my friends, but it's not appropriate for the classroom. So I've learned to adopt a more formal speech because that's what is appropriate when speaking in a professional manner. And what the Europeans commonly did was speak to colonial peoples in a way that would be deemed unprofessional. Really what they were doing is demeaning these people through their actions. Uh, now under these conditions, many of the uh, educated colonials began to resent the very parent countries which had come there claiming to civilize them. And it was from this uh, mixture of resentment and hope for a better life that the modern nationalist movements began in these regions of Asia and Africa and the Middle East and even Latin America. And so during the first quarter of the 20th century, from the Suez Canal all the way to the Pacific Ocean, educated people in these colonial areas began to organize and began to seek an end to foreign rule and to seek independence for themselves. And this brings us to the subject of religion and nationalism. If you decide to go to a university and you want to take um, some history classes, I would encourage you to take a class on nationalism. What does it mean to be a part of a nation? One of the appealing ideas of Karl Marx to the very poor is that Karl Marx taught that nationalism was a tool of the elites to divide people to keep them fighting amongst themselves. But what is nationalism? It's human nature to group together with like-minded people. It's human nature to seek out people that have a similar way of life, that look the same, that have the same interests, that speak the same way, that enjoy the same things. Religion is a great common factor for many people. It's like, oh, you're of this particular religion. Well, cool, yeah, let's talk about it. Great, and suddenly you're friends. And that's a, a, an avenue for sparking a relationship. And so um, with many of these colonial areas, religion became a unifier within their own people, but then a divisive factor when looking at their parent countries. Think of Buddhism and the French colony of Indochina. By the 1950s, you had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire to protest the ruler of the country supported by the United States, Ngo Diem, because he was trying to force Buddhist people to become Catholic. And so the people of Indochina identified themselves as Buddhist, which united them as a people. But now let's talk about, uh, since we're going to begin to look at several different places, We'll begin with Burma. Now, the first expression of nationalism in Burma, which is in Southeast Asia, came from students at the University of Rangoon. And like the story I told you in Vietnam, they were protesting persecution of the Buddhist religion from the British official stationed there. 
And it was often small things. Perhaps the British saw them as small things. For example, British officials would refuse to remove their footwear when entering a Buddhist temple. British officials would refuse to respect the customs of the people that they were supposed to be protecting. It's offensive. Now you might say, look, it's, it's shoes. You know, get over it. That's just one example. But when it's as simple as saying it would show respect if you would be willing to remove your shoes when you come into this place, and then someone refuses, that's highly offensive. You know, perhaps you have a friend who is a, a devout Christian, and um, they don't appreciate you using um, their God's name in vain. Most people out of respect would say, sure, sorry, I'll try to not do that. It takes a real jerk to continue to do that in their presence purposely. And, again, this would be one example. So feeling disrespected, these people formed a group called the Takin. And in the Burmese language, this means Lord or master. And the purpose of the name is actually quite significant because they chose this name out of a desire to rule themselves. Now, in the Dutch East Indies, we're no longer talking about Buddhism. Islam was the dominant religion practiced. And in this case, China was the dominant power there. Now, many of these people living in the Dutch East Indies, many of these activists realized the problem wasn't the Chinese merchants who were conducting business there. The problem was the subjugation brought about by a colonial presence. And so this, uh, what had begun as a self-help society called Sarakat Islam, eventually became a nationalist independence movement. And like the Takins, this party would be the group to lead their country to independence following the Second World War. Now, there's a bit of a quandary that comes up when discussing nationalism. Number one, independence is difficult. I don't know if you followed the news last year when Scotland was discussing seeking independence from Great Britain. I was excited. I don't know about you, but I was a Braveheart fan when I was a kid. I thought William Wallace was the man. I even memorized the speech, and I've done it for parties, where I get up and yell the speech, and it's awesome, it's fun. And I loved that movie as a kid. Because it's a theme we can all get around. Independence. Freedom. But there's a cost that comes with freedom. And when the Scottish... <laughs> William Wallace must have been turning in his grave because he was tortured to death for that very cause. Because when the Scottish voted last year to stay with Britain, they did so not out of a real fear for freedom. I mean, Britain's a free country. But they did so because of the resources that remaining with Britain provided. See, building a new nation requires more than just an anger toward a ruler. It makes for a good movie when the peasants storm the castle, but nobody ever shows the other end. You know, the, what happens after the movie, after the peasants have stormed the castle? Well, I'll tell you, what typically happens is a reign of terror and anarchy followed by someone else setting up in the castle. 
And so the trouble is, it's easy, relatively, to push a leader out of power. It's difficult to actually go about the business of ruling a country effectively. See, it creates a host of issues. And so um, many of these would-be patriots began having these discussions of which is expedient. Should we seek to modernize our country and focus on the resources that the colonial power can provide? Or should we seek independence first? And um, I can't say there's one blanket answer. I mean, we are discussing world history here, so I can only give you a handful of examples. The book gives you much more. But the answer really depends on the reputation of the colonial power within that particular colony. If the colonial power was seen as a uh, positive thing, well, then a gradual approach was appropriate. Um, in the case of uh, Britain and many other colonies, there's a lasting relationship between these colonies and Great Britain. Canada still regards themselves as a member of the British Commonwealth. They were originally a British colony, and they still consider themselves part of the larger British community they still revere the Queen of England as their sovereign. Yet they were a colony. But they're now an independent country. But culturally, they still have these close ties. Why? Because there was always a close relationship between Great Britain and Canada. And so for them, you know, you don't hear of violent Canadian revolution against Great Britain. Why? Well, because there was this close relationship. But if the colonial power were seen as an impediment to change or oppressive, then the first priority for that colony would be independence. And sadly, I can give you a lot more examples of that, where people, the leaders within this revolution would eventually decide independence was necessary. I want to start with some extreme examples. The tiny island of Jamaica, I don't know if you're a, a reggae fan or if you're Bob Marley or into that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of Bob Marley's songs are political in nature, like Get Up, Stand Up for Your Rights or Exodus or uh, even uh, my favorite, uh, them crazy bald heads talking about their white oppressors. You see, the tiny island of Jamaica was a slave colony. Slaves outnumbered whites living there nine to one. And eventually the slaves living in Jamaica decided it would be best, because they were being treated as slaves, to rise up against their masters. Well, were these slaves capable of forming a government? Did they have educated politicians among them? No, but they were being beaten and killed. And so in the case of Jamaica, you know, it's, a, it's polar opposite from what was happening in Canada. That's just one example. Now, the vast majority of these patriots became convinced, and at this time we're discussing the violent revolutions, that to survive whether they've chosen to seek their independence immediately or take the long road, that for their civilizations to survive, they would have to wind up adopting many Western principles. For example, uh, in 1898, a young Filipino named Emilio Aguinaldo, I believe this chapter gets into him, approached President William McKinley and requested help in seeking independence from the Spanish who were ruling over the Philippines and even wanted to adopt a U.S.-based constitution. I mean, almost word-for-word -word copy. 
But he was ready to go all in. But the only thing, his, his people wanted to be independent. They wanted freedom. Because in their case, they saw colonialism as a negative. And um, otherwise, they agreed with democracy completely. Now, you'll have to read the book to find out. It's not such a happy ending with poor Emilio. Um, now, <clears throat> in many cases, it's traditional culture that allows these patriots to unite their people against their colonies. And so these traditional values provide, as your book describes, an ideological symbol that people can rally around. Uh, for the Jews in AD 70, seeking independence from the Romans, it was a man named Maccabees who claimed to be the Messiah. And so he used a traditional symbol to rally the people, and in their case it ended badly because the Romans destroyed the Jews and dispersed them around the world. Um, now, many of these urban intellectuals, and that's, that's really who we're looking at, are in cities, these Western educated elites, wealthy individuals, uh, living in these colonial countries, um, often had difficulty communicating uh, with the rural populations who in reality didn't understand uh, these concepts of democracy or nationhood. Uh, for example, Gandhi, quite a brilliant man. There's a great movie about him. Uh, highly, highly educated, highly intelligent. Um, led one of the most remarkable, peaceful resistance movements against one of the most powerful nations on earth at that time. And he won. But he lost the peace. You see, India and Pakistan were once one country. But in the absence of the British government to maintain the peace, as soon as they were free from British rule, they factioned off by religion. Now, in fact, I'd like to use this quote from your book uh, from an Indonesian intellectual. His name is Sutan Sia Rear. And he remarked, speaking of um, a French educated Vietnamese reformist, why, monsieur, you are more French than I am. And uh, he was pointing out to this um, colonial subject who had been educated in France, had lost his identity. Now we're going to be talking about Gandhi and the Indian National Conference. So I've gotten into a little of this already because the story is just so fascinating. Um, but India is the classic example of a nation which no longer identified itself with its parent country, had begun to feel disrespected by its parent country, largely on the question of religion. See, in the latter half of the 1800s, a, a national consciousness began to arise. And, um, and a, a large part of this is due to uh, the arrogance of the British colonial authorities. Many of these Indian nationalists like the um, template we've been discussing, were wealthy and were educated in Western countries. Many of them were from larger cities in India, such as Bombay or Madras or Calcutta. Um, 
many tended to prefer reform rather than revolution, uh, meaning that they hoped to stay with Britain until they were ready to independently rule at a date to be decided in the future. So they believed that India needed to modernize before they could begin the question of independence. And um, they would achieve this through reform. While if the British were treating them badly, maybe there was a peaceful method to end the poor treatment, was their hope. Now, by the 1880s, the British government was allowing a measure of self-government, but all too often, this self-government was actually sabotaged by the British officials on the ground. And so because of this, because of really local British resistance, reform was occurring at a slow pace to the point where these Indian nationalists who had been hoping for the British to be reasonable and reform-minded, these Indian nationalists began to realize that hoping for change wasn't going to happen. You know, I just I really enjoy watching political debates. I think you need to watch both from both parties. It's part of being a good citizen. And there was a point in the debate last night. I'm not going to mention names. One candidate said during their time in politics, they had tried to work with Wall Street to ask them to reform and to treat people <clears throat> more decently. And the other candidate responded by saying, asking is not worth a whole lot because you can't expect people to be kind. And unfortunately, that's what the Indian nationalists were seeing here, is that the hope for benevolence in their particular case was futile. Now, in 1885, a small group of Indians met in Bombay to form the Indian National Conference. They hoped to speak for the entire nation. But many of these were wealthy, English educated Hindus. And like I pointed out previously, India split as soon as they achieved independence. Why? Well, because half of India are Muslim. Half of Indians are Muslim. The other half are in Hindus. Well, I should point out, India is home to three of the world's chief religions because there are many Buddhists living there as well. Now, members of the Indian National Conference, like their predecessors, did not seek immediate independence. They hoped for reform as well. Now, when I've been studying Karl Marx for this class, it's kind of scary. Because really, if you read Karl Marx, you're reading one of the more brilliant uh, minds of the past 200 years. And Karl Marx, though communism is scary and resulted in the Soviet Union and the reigns of terror and, and the deaths of tens of millions. So when I read it, I have to balance it with that. This is what it looks like in practice. But in theory, why is his first step violent revolution? <laughs> because as he says, the history hitherto of mankind has been defined by class struggle. And that's what we're seeing in this case. He said it will not end until the producers and the consumers, the producers and the consumers can reach a peaceful understanding and uh, that the people can own the means of production. But in this case here, in this particular case, um, 
was believed that reform, not violent revolution, could solve the problem. That uh, within their own country there were things that needed to be put to an end, like the arranged marriage of children or the practice of sati, uh, which was the traditional practice of burning uh, wives when their husbands would pass away. And even these, uh, and these Indian nationalists, educated in Western universities, saw that this practice was barbarous. <laughs> but even though they did see the need for reform within their own country, they hoped for a greater role in the governing process. And that if Britain would invest more in the economic development of India and spend less on military campaigns, then their country would prosper. You'd be surprised. That was the chief subject of the Democratic National Primary Debate last night. So this isn't necessarily history. It's more relevant than you'd like to think. Now, in this case, the British gave them a pittance, but were unwilling to um, begin to give any true form of independence or any true form of economic investment. It was more of a political gambit. Now, the Indian National Congress had a, a real difficulty reconciling religious differences within their own ranks. Because you see, there's, there's an irony here that their goal was self-determination for Indians, regardless of class or religion, that the freedom to decide for yourselves, true democracy. But true democracy clashed with their traditional customs. You see, Hinduism, for those of you who have had uh, ancient world history or know anything about Hinduism, is a caste-based system. Society is structured in their religion according to a pyramid, with very few at the top. The majority of the people are called sudras, or peasants. And then a large number of people are called pariahs, or untouchables, and exist so far beneath the wealthy, they were not even allowed to touch them. And so there were some cultural barriers to progress as well. For example, in the early 20th century, a separate independence movement in India called the Muslim League was created to represent the interest of the millions at this time. So next I want to get into talking about Gandhi specifically. Now a little about Gandhi. Mohandas Gandhi, born in 1869, passed away in 1948, was a firm believer in nonviolent resistance. I strongly recommend you watch the movie because we don't have enough time to fully get into him today. But he returned from South Africa where he had been practicing as a lawyer, returned to India, in 1915 and became active in the Indian National Conference. So what makes him such a special leader is that he was able to single-handedly transform the movement and he was able to unite his people for just a brief time, unite them on this common cause of independence. Now, he studied law in London. Again, the, the classic example of a young, wealthy, urban, Indian 
native who went to London to study and began to practice law. And actually, he went to South Africa, which was a different English colony. And so he was practicing law in South Africa. And he was serving and working for Indian immigrants who had moved there and were working as laborers, really as second-class citizens. He was representing their legal interests. And in doing so, he became aware of institutional racism within the society that he was serving. And that these Indian laborers working in South Africa were being exploited. Now, upon returning to India, he became active in this independence movement. The Hindu term for non-violent resistance is Sutyograha. Sutyograha. And this means, and I quote, hold fast to the truth. The goal is to try to force the British to improve the lot of the poor. Well, how do you do this in a nonviolent way? And this is where I think he's brilliant. So how do you convince people who have been historically exploiting the people you represent, how do you convince them to stop acting like jerks without violence? Hold fast to the truth, according to Gandhi. And what does that mean? So his goals were to convert the British to his views while simultaneously uniting his people and building up their self-respect. When the British saw him as an agitator, they tried to suppress the Indian National Conference by actually going to the conference and telling them to disperse. It's one of the best scenes in the whole movie because Gandhi, sitting on the stage with these British officials, peacefully and calmly says, we will not fight against you, but we will not obey you. There are hundreds of millions of us and very few of you. What are you going to do about it? I'm just like, oh, that's awesome. Okay? Because the, the beauty of it is it wasn't just words. He backed it up. You see, one example of uh, exploitation was that the British required the Indian people to purchase British textiles. So they had been buying Indian cotton at extremely low prices. And then they had been manufacturing that cotton into clothes and forcing the Indians to buy the more expensive product. And so one of Gandhi's first actions was to start making his own clothes, which was actually illegal in British colonial India. And so he started wearing a simple dhoti. Uh, this is just um, a single piece of coarse homespun cotton made from his own spinning wheel. Now, sadly, um, not all of Gandhi's story is peaceful. Now, by this time that he had stood up to the British in a peaceful way, and he'd begun to break British laws in a peaceful way, uh, the Indian people loved him. They called him Mahama. Mahama. And this means great soul. He began to organize mass protest. Sadly, these often got out of hand. And in many cases, British troops killed hundreds 
of unarmed protesters. You know, I want you to think about the American Civil Rights Movement and the horrible injustices of police officers sicking dogs on protesters or spraying them with fire hoses or in the famous case of the Freedom Riders in Alabama and an angry mob stopped a bus and blew it up. Or the young individuals like James Meredith who were brave enough to go into all white universities. Or the Medgar Evers of the world who were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan for simply trying to promote equality. Those are tragic stories because they're our stories, because they're American stories, and because we've seen them on television and we've watched the movies about them. But they're not the only stories, you see. There are countless stories of the same thing going on in other parts of the world, and the point I want to make with this course is that those are our stories too. You see, British troops were killing hundreds of unarmed protesters. Gandhi was so horrified by this that he actually stepped down from his active role in the Indian National Congress. He actually said, I don't want to cause further suffering to my people. Even though he was willing to step back from the movement, he was still arrested, still spent several years in prison. Now, Gandhi was a Hindu. Even though he, he protested the caste system and sought to bring an end to it. And really, though he was born and raised a Hindu, today we might call him a universalist. Which, by the way, there is a universalist church in Brevard, and there's one in Flat Rock. Uh, universalism is the idea that God transcends individual religion so that God is bigger than any one particular religion. That religions attempt to define God and fall short. That's called universalism, and that was Gandhi's understanding. Uh, in fact, in a speech in 1931, he described God, and I quote, as an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything, an unseen power which makes itself felt and yet defies all proof. Now, the neat thing about this particular understanding of God is there's no divisive element to it. There's no... My God is named Brahman. Yours is named Allah. We must fight. No, there's none of that in Gandhi's philosophy. Now, while Gandhi was in prison, the movement continued. The British had a big problem on their hands because what Gandhi said was absolutely correct, that a few cannot control the many, if the many do not want to be controlled. And so to try to placate the rebellion, the British passed the Government of India Act. And this actually created an um, indigenous legislative council that would be elected democratically. Also, under the same law, local democratic governments could be formed. And by this simple law, over five million Indian people were given the right to vote on a degree of their government. This still was not full independence. The British still retained executive control, judicial control, the Indians were merely allowed to make laws. At this time, the Indian National Congress had already decided that it was full independence that they were going to work towards. In 
when Gandhi was released from prison, he decided to return to his policy of civil disobedience. And this means that he was not going to obey British laws until the Indian people were given their independence. He was arrested again, as were many of his followers. And continued to be arrested as more organizations for greater independence were forming throughout the subcontinent. An interesting thing here is that women made up roughly 10% of the people uh, taking part in these demonstrations. Uh, numerous women marched. Um, they were involved in picketing. Um, they would also make clothing of their own to wear. And they even had their own women's associations. And in fact, had uh, even achieved uh, some great successes on their own. For example, in 1929, the Sarda Act uh, raised the minimum age of marriage to 14, ending the practice of very, very young marriage. Now, throughout the 1930s, another leader of the Indian National Congress emerged, and his name was Jawaharlal Nehru. He had also been educated in Great Britain, and he was a member of kind of the 1%, the top of the Hindu caste. Um, and so he was you know, almost born into this role, a, a sort of born leader. Um, yet when he rose to power, the Indian National Conference began to split into two different paths, religious and then Gandhi's more secular approach. And so, as I was saying, this, this more religious, this more conservative approach is going to create this eventual rift or split uh, between the Hindus and the Muslims living there. Okay, so in talking about the nationalist revolts in the Middle East, we're really talking about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire had dominated the eastern Mediterranean Sea and what we're now calling the Middle East ever since the fall of the city of Constantinople, which was the final collapse of the Byzantine Empire in 1453. This empire, that is the Ottoman Empire, had been growing. Um, and by the end of the 1700s, um, they were already beginning to decline. There were several problems. Number one, with government corruption. Next, the declining effectiveness of leadership. And then finally, the loss of territory to outside invasions. Now, it, throughout North Africa, which was still under Ottoman authority by the beginning of the First World War, though that authority would be tenuous at best. And so really, the Ottoman Empire was on the decline by the First World War. They were a part of the Central Powers fighting against the United States, Britain, and France, but they were barely a, a player in the war because they were on the decline. In fact, France had already seized much of their territory, such as Algeria and Tunisia, and the British had established a protectorate over the Nile River Valley in Egypt. Now, when I spoke of internal strife, a failure in leadership. Uh, one of the instances of this I wanted to talk about was the Young Turk Revolution, and this was in 1908. Um, reformists, elements in Istanbul, tried from time to time to resist the trend 
But military defeats continued. Greece declared its independence from the Ottoman Empire in the early 1900s. And this was a continuation of a steady decline of Ottoman power. Um, also, we have to understand the sense of nationalism that we've been talking about, the idea of self-determination, that ethnic groups want to join together because they want a government that represents them in particular. And one of the groups that really clung to this idea were the Serbs, as well as the Armenians, many people around the Balkan Peninsula. And other minorities threaten the stability and the cohesion of the Ottoman Empire. When you have a multinational, multi-ethnic nation, it can be difficult to maintain a sense of national identity unless there is a larger unifying purpose. We as Americans are a multi-ethnic, multinational, multicultural people. We are united by a common cause of democracy. Though if you keep up with the news, it doesn't always feel like we're united, does it? And it certainly was a problem in the Ottoman Empire. Now throughout the 1870s, a new generation of reformers seized power in Istanbul and pushed through a constitution. In fact, they went on to create a legislative assembly representing all peoples in the state. However, the sultan they placed on the throne suspended the charter and attempted to rule by traditional authoritarian means. And so many times these revolutions do try to work within the system, like we just saw how these young Turks attempted to reform their government by starting a version of democracy, yet the sultan who was over the empire at that time wanted to maintain power and suppress what perhaps could have been a productive movement. Now, by the end of the century, uh, the 1876 Constitution had become a symbol for change for these reformist elements, and now these people were calling themselves the Young Turks. They found support in the army and among many Turks living in exile. Now, by 1908, the Young Turks had forced the Sultan to restore the Constitution, and eventually he was removed the next year. Now, the Young Turks appeared at a critical moment for this empire. See, there were a number of internal rebellions going on. Um, for example, Austria had annexed significant amounts of Ottoman territories in the Balkans, that is, around the Greek peninsula. Um, this undermined support for the new government and provoked eventually the army to step in. And most minorities from the old empire now had been effectively removed from Istanbul's authority. Um, so really, the Ottoman Empire was disintegrating. The multi-ethnic, multinational parts of it were falling apart. Uh, that idea of self-determination, people didn't want to belong to an empire that they felt that did not represent them. Um, and so eventually, the new concept of a Turkish state, instead of an Ottoman state, that would be based on Turkish nationality. But the real final blow to this empire came at the end of the First World War. The Ottoman Empire made the fatal mistake of allying with Germany. The hope was to drive the British from Egypt and to restore Ottoman rule in the Nile Valley. Perhaps had Germany won this war, the Ottoman Empire would still exist. Perhaps had Germany won this war, the Middle East would still be united. Maybe there would have been no 9-11. I'm not saying a good or bad, it's just the cause and effect here is significant. Now, in response, the British declared an official protectorate over Egypt after the First World War. And this was aided in large part by the famous British adventurer T.E. Lawrence from the famous movie Lawrence of Arabia, who sought to undermine Ottoman rule in the Arabian Peninsula, and he helped encourage the Arab nationalists there to rise up against these Ottoman overlords. In fact, during the First World War in 1916, the local governor of Mecca, the holiest city in the Muslim religion, declared Arabia to be independent from Ottoman rule. As British troops advanced from Egypt, they went on to seize Palestine as well, in fact. Now, by October of 1918, which, by the way, I wanted to point out, 
the seizure of Palestine during the First World War is very significant. No European country had controlled Palestine since the Crusades. It had been several centuries um, since uh, Salahuddin uh, led the Arabic forces in the, um, to conquer the city of Jerusalem. And from that time forward, in the 1400s, no European nation had held uh, Jerusalem. So it was significant when the British retook this area. Now, Turkey didn't collapse all at once. In fact, Turkey is still a country. You know, we're not calling it Lawrence of Arabia. You know, we're not calling it a, the British protectorate of Turkey. It wasn't conquered. It still exists. And it exists largely because it was reformed and called the Republic of Turkey. And this was officially formed in 1923. And so during the next years, the tottering Ottoman Empire began to fall apart. As the British and French made plans to divide up Ottoman territories in the Middle East, um, the Greeks won Allied approval to seize the western parts of the Anatolian Peninsula, which is really just the land around Asia Minor between um, where Constantinople once was and the border with Russia, and we're just calling that Anatolia. Um, the dream was to recreate the substance, if not the culture, of the old Byzantine Empire. Now, the Byzantine Empire had been a Christian empire. It was the former remnants of the old Roman Empire, and that's gone. That was actually conquered and overturned in 1453, but the hope with reforming Turkey in 1923 was to recreate the commercial success of Constantinople. Now, by the way, Constantinople wasn't destroyed either. It is now called Istanbul. It is now the capital of Turkey. Uh, it's where one of the most famous Christian and Muslim churches exists. It was once called um, Hagia Sophia, um, the Church of Holy Wisdom and it is now a famous mosque and so they have preserved it and it's a really neat example of cultural blending because you see both religions honored in the same building now the impending collapse energized key elements in turkey under the leadership of a war hero and that's colonel mustafa kemal and um, he successfully defended um, parts of turkey against the british in the first world war now he's resigned from the army and he um, attempted to call a national congress that would call for the creation of a democratic government, uh, yet preserving the empire's remaining territories, and this would create the new Republic of Turkey. The capital was to be at Ankara Kemal, and the idea was to drive the Greeks entirely from the Anatolian Peninsula and to persuade the British to agree to a new treaty. Now, by 1923, the last Ottoman ruler fled the country, and it was declared officially a Turkish Republic, and the formal end to the Ottoman Empire was 1923. Now, during the next few years, the first elected president to the new Republic of Turkey, which, by the way, it still remains a republic today, um, and they're closely allied with the United States. Fun fact, I don't know if you knew that we were hiding nukes in Turkey while the Russians were hiding nukes in Cuba. And the agreement was the Russians would remove them from Cuba on the condition we remove them from Turkey. So we've been close allies ever since the creation of this republic. Now, over the next few years, the new president, Mustafa Kemal, now known as Ataturk, um, which means Father Turk, attempted to transform Turkey into a modern, secular republic with a separation of church and state. The idea was to put a democratic system in place centering around a democratically elected legislature called the Grand National Assembly. Uh, however, the president proved to be relatively intolerant of opposition and wound up suppressing critics. You see, by this point, Turkey had a long embedded culture of authoritarianism, of people who liked the idea of being in power. Democracy is all about being open to criticism. 
and being willing to tolerate differing ideas. Pluralism is essential to democracy, but that can be a hard lesson to learn, even for Americans today. And so often the president was intolerant of critics. Meanwhile, Turkish nationalism was emphasized in the Turkish language, which was now written using the Roman alphabet, um, was removed of many of its Arabic elements. Popular education was emphasized. Old aristic, aristocratic titles like Pasha and Bey were abolished. And all Turkish citizens were given family names in the European style. So Ataturk's hope was to modernize his nation culturally, but also to modernize his economy. And he hoped to do this by overseeing the establishment of a light industrial sector. The goal was to focus on the production of textiles, on glass, on paper, and cement, and to institute even five-year plans like the Soviets, um, to institute state direction of the economy. So in some ways you could argue this was a controlled economy. However, Ataturk was no admirer of Soviet communism. Um, the Turkish economy could better be described not as communism, but perhaps as state capitalism. Um, he also established training institutions and model farms in an attempt to modernize the agricultural sector. Such reforms, however, had little effect uh, because generally the common person in Turkey was very uneducated. Now, one of the most significant aspects of Ataturk's reform program was his attempt to break the power of the Islamic clerics to actually separate the church from the state in his country. The hope was to create a secular state. Now, meanwhile, the caliphate um, was formally abolished and formally removed from political power in 1924. And Sharia law, meaning law uh, by Muslim decree, was replaced with the revised version of the Swiss law code, which is not unlike our own. Um, the fez, a uh, popular cap without a brim worn by Turkish Muslims, was actually abolished as a form of a headdress. Women were discouraged from wearing the traditional Islamic veil. Uh, by 1934, in fact, women were given the right to vote and were considered under the law legally equal to men in all aspects, including marriage as well as inheritance. Education and professions were now open to all citizens, regardless of gender. Some women even began to enter into politics, and all citizens were given the right to practice the religion of their choice. Now, his success and his popularity was enormous, although not all of his reforms were widely accepted, especially by devout Muslims who were unwilling to accept this new cosmopolitan culture. Most of the changes he introduced have endured, even after he passed in 1938. In fact, in virtually every respect, the Turkish Republic was the beginnings of the modern state of Turkey, which again, still exists today, still close friends with the United States. And now let's continue talking about this nationalistic revolt, but we're gonna move on to Iran. And um, first we're going to look at pressures from Russia and Britain. You see, Iran, once known as the Empire of Persia, the famous enemies of the Greeks and the, um, in the wars against Sparta and Athens, Xerxes, if you've seen 300, well, it's the same group of people. Um, but under the Kehar dynasty, uh, the country of Iran had not been very successful. Um, in fact, the Russians had advanced into the Caucasus Mountains, and um, Iran really had a number of their own problems at this point. 
Uh, but the first was to secure themselves from foreign influence. And to do this, the Kehars moved the capital to Tehran, which is in a mountainous area south of the Caspian Sea. And throughout the mid-1800s, uh, one Shah attempted to introduce political and economic reforms, uh, but faced countless resistance from tribal and religious, uh, predominantly different denominations of Muslims, uh, who resisted uh, his influence. Um, increasingly, the dynasty turned more towards Russia and Great Britain to protect itself from their own people. Now, by 1906, the growing foreign presence had led to the rise of a Persian national movement. And um, this was supported by Shiite religious leaders, um, whose opposition to the regime rose steadily among both the poor as well as the business class in the cities. And by 1906, popular pressure forced the Shah to grant a constitution based on the Western model. As in the Ottoman Empire, as well as at what we saw in Manchu, China, however, the, moderni the mar modernizers had moved too soon because their power base was not yet secure. Now, with the support of the Russians and the British, the Shah regained control while two foreign powers began to divide the country into separate spheres of influence. And one reason for this interest was the discovery of oil reserves in Persia in 1908. And over the next few years, oil exports increased rapidly, with the bulk of these profits going into British investors. Now, by 1921, Reza Khan, who was an officer in the Persian army, had seized power in Tehran, which is the capital of Iran at this time. His intent was to establish a republic, but he met significant resistance from the traditional forces there. By 1925, the new Pahlavi dynasty with Reza Khan as Shah replaced the defunct Kehar dynasty. And over the next couple of years, Reza Khan attempted to follow the example of Ataturk in Turkey. He introduced reforms to strengthen the central government, hoping to modernize the civilian and military bureaucracy, and went on to establish a modern economic infra infrastructure. By 1935, he had officially changed the name of the nation to the nation of I Iran. So we no longer call it the Empire of Persia. It is now the nation of Iran, of course. Unlike Ataturk, however, Reza Khan did not attempt to destroy the power of Islamic beliefs, but he did encourage the establishment of a Western-style educational system. And he also forbade women to wear the veil in public. Women continued to be exploited in Iran, however. The carpets produced, uh, excuse me, the carpets produced by their intensive labor were a major export, second only to the oil there uh, in the years between the two world wars. Now, to strengthen Iranian nationalism and reduce the power of Islam, Reza Khan attempted to popularize the symbols and beliefs of pre-Islamic times. Like his Kehar predecessors, however, he was hindered by strong foreign influence. When the Soviet Union and Great Britain decided to send troops into the country during the Second World War, he resigned in protest and died three years later. And so next, let's talk about the nation of Iraq. And so remember, all of these nations, Iraq, Turkey, and then um, Saudi Arabia, and many of the Arab nationalities that, that formed countries of their own, um, sprang from this former Ottoman Empire. And so really, I'm attempting in an hour to describe the modern Middle East, if I can. Now, another consequence of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire was the emergence of a new political entity along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And once these were the heartland of ancient empires. Now lacking defensible borders and sharply divided along ethnic and religious lines, a Shiite majority in rural areas, and a vocal Sunni minority in the cities, and a large Kurdish population in the northern territories, the region had been under Ottoman rule since the 17th century. 
So I'd just like to restate that. You have three main ethnic cultural groups in Iraq, Shiites, Sunnis, and Kurds. None of these people like each other. They have often been involved in cultural violent conflicts. It's difficult when you get a nation of three groups that hate each other. Now, during the First World War, British forces occupied the area from Baghdad southward to the Persian Gulf to protect the oil-producing regions in neighboring Iran from a German takeover. Although the British claimed to have arrived as liberators, in 1920 the League of Nations placed the country under British control as the mandate of Iraq. Growing civil unrest as well as anti-Western sentiment rapidly dispelled any plans for the emergence of an independent government. And in 1921, after the suppression of resistance forces, the country was placed under the titular authority of King Faisal of Syria, who was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Now Faisal relied for support primarily on the politically more sophisticated urban Sunni population, although they represented less than a quarter of the population. Now the discovery of oil in Kirkuk in 1927 increased the value of the area to the British, who granted formal independence to Iraq in 1932 although British advisors retained a strong influence over the fragile government. Now, as we've seen, the Arab rising during the First World War helped bring about the demise of the Ottoman Empire. There had been resistance to Ottoman rule in the Arabian Peninsula since the 18th century when the devoutly Muslim Wahhabi sect attempted to drive out outside influences and cleanse Islam of corrupt practices that had developed in past centuries. This revolt was eventually suppressed, but Wahhabi influence persisted. Now, the First World War actually offered an opportunity for Arabs to throw off the shackles of Ottoman rule. But the question was, what would replace them? The Arabs were not a nation. They were an idea, a loose collection of peoples who often did not see eye to eye on matters that affected their community. Disagreement over what constitutes an Arab has plagued generations of political leaders who have sought unsuccessfully to knit together the disparate peoples of the region into a single Arabic nation. The Ottomans tried and failed. The British are trying and failing as I'm describing it. And currently Americans are trying and failing to unite Arab peoples around democratic principles. When the Arab leaders in Mecca declared their independence from Ottoman rule in 1916, they had hoped for British support, but they were to be sorely disappointed. At the close of the war, the British and French created a number of mandates in the area under the supervision of the League of Nations. Iraq was assigned to the British, Syria and Lebanon, the two areas that were separated so that Christian peoples in Lebanon could be placed under Christian administration, were given to the French. And next I want to talk about the Wahhabi kingdoms of Saudi Arabia. In the early 1920s, Ibn Saud, a Wahhabi leader and descendant of the family that had led the 18th century revolt, united Arab tribes in the northern parts of the Arabian Peninsula and actually drove out the remnants of Ottoman rule. This leader was devout and gifted. Ibn Saud won broad support among the Arab tribal peoples and established the kingdom of Saudi Arabia throughout much of the peninsula in 1932. At first, this new kingdom consisted essentially of the vast waves of desert of Central Arabia. They were desperately poor and they depended on income from Muslim pilgrims coming to visit the holy sites in Mecca and Medina. But during the 1930s, American companies began to explore for oil and in 1938, Standard Oil made a successful strike at Dharam on the Persian Gulf. Soon, an Arabian-American oil conglomerate pop popularly called Aramco was established and the isolated kingdom was suddenly inundated by Western oil men and untold wealth. 
<clears throat> and now let's talk about the complicated issue of Palestine. The land of Palestine, once the home of the Jews, is now primarily inhabited by Muslim Arabs. And it was made a separate mandate and immediately became a problem for the British. In 1837, the Austrian-born journalist Theodore Herzl convened an international conference in Switzerland that led to the creation of the World Zionist Organization. Its aim was to create a homeland in Palestine for the Jewish people, who had long been dispersed throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Over the next decade, Jewish immigration into Palestine, then under Ottoman rule, increased with the World Zionist Organization's support. And by the outbreak of World War I, about 85,000 Jews lived in Palestine. These represented about 15% of the total Jewish population in the world. In 1917, responding to appeals from the British chemist Chaim Weizerman, British Foreign Secretary Lord Arthur Balfour issued a declaration saying Palestine was to be a national home for the Jews. The Balfour Declaration, which was later confirmed by the League of Nations, was ambiguous on the legal status of territory and promised that the rights of non-Jewish peoples currently living in the area would not be undermined. But Arab nationalities were incensed. How could a national home for the Jewish people be established in a territory where the majority of the population was Muslim? Now, after the First World War, more Jewish settlers began to arrive in Palestine in response to the promises made in the Balfour Declaration. As tensions between the new armies and existing Muslim residents began to escalate, the British tried to restrict Jewish immigration into the territory while Arab voices rejected the concept of a separate state. In a bid to relieve Arab sensibilities, Great Britain created the separate emirate of Transjordan out of the eastern portion of Palestine. After World War II, it would become the independent kingdom of Jordan. And the stage was set for the conflicts that would take place in the region after the Second World War. Meanwhile, in Egypt, Great Britain had maintained a loose protectorate over Egypt since the mid-19th century, although the area remained nominally under the Ottoman rule. London formalized its protectorate in 1914 to protect the Suez Canal, as well as the Nile Valley, from possible seizure of the Central Powers. After the war, however, Nationalistic elements became restive and formed the WAFT Party. And this was a secular organization dedicated to the creation of an independent Egypt based on the principles of representative government. The WAFD received the support of many middle class Egyptians who, like Ataturk in Turkey, hoped to meld Islamic practices with the secular tradition of the modern West. Now, the modernist form of Islam did not have broad appeal outside of the multicultural cosmopolitan centers. However, and in 1928, the Muslim cleric Hassan al-Banna organized the Muslim Brotherhood, which demanded strict adherence to the teachings of the Prophet as set forth in the Quran. Now, the Brotherhood rejected Western ways and sought to create a new Egypt based firmly on the precepts of Sharia. And by the 1930s, the organization had as many as a million different members. Now, according to Marxist <coughs> doctrine, communist parties should be made up of urban factory workers alienated from capitalist society by inhumane working conditions. In practice, many of the leaders, even in the European communist parties, tended to be urban intellectuals or members of the lower middle class. That phenomena was even more true in the non-Western world, where most early Marxists were rootless intellectuals. Some were probably drawn to the movement for patriotic reasons and saw Marxist doctrine as a new, more effective system of modernizing their societies and removing the colonial exploiters.
Others were attracted by the utopian dream of a classless society. For those who had lost their faith in traditional religion, communism often served as a new secular ideology that replaced the lost truth of traditional faiths. Of course, the new doctrine's appeal was not the same in all non-Western societies. In Confucian societies such as China and Vietnam, where traditional belief systems had been badly discredited by their failure to counter the Western challenge, communism had an immediate impact and rapidly became a major factor in the anti-colonial movement. In Buddhist and Muslim societies where traditional religion remained strong and became a cohesive factor in the resistance movement, communism had even less success. To maximize their appeal and minimize potential conflict with traditional ideas, communist parties frequently attempted to adapt Marxist doctrine to indigenous values and institutions. In the Middle East, for example, the Ba'ath Party in Syria adopted a hybrid socialism combining Marxism with Arab nationalism. In Africa, radical intellectuals talked vaguely of a uniquely African road to socialism. The party's success in establishing alliances with nationalist parties while building support among the working classes also varied from place to place. In some instances, the communists were briefly able to work with the bourgeoisie parties. The famous example was the alliance between the Communist Party of China and Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party. In 1928, however, the common turn reacting to Chiang Kai-shek's betrayal of the alliance gave up these efforts and declared the Communist parties should focus on recruiting the most revolutionary elements of society, notably the urban intellectuals and the working class. Harassed by colonial authorities, and saddled with directions from Moscow that often had little relevance to local conditions. Communist parties in most colonial societies had little success in the 1930s and failed to build a secure base of support among the massive population. Now, overall, revolutionary Marxism had its greatest impact in China, where a group of young radicals founded the Chinese Communist Party in 1921. Now, the rise of the Chinese Communist Party was a consequence of the failed revolution of 1911. When political forces are too weak or too divided to consolidate their power, during a period of instability, the military usually steps in to fill in the vacuum. In China, Sun Yat-sen, and his colleagues had accepted General Wan Shikak um, as president of the new Chinese Republic in 1911, mainly because they lacked the military force to compete with his control over the army. But some had misgivings about Wan's intentions. As one remarked in a letter to a friend, quote, we don't know whether he will be a George Washington or a Napoleon. As it turned out, he was neither. Showing little comprehension of the new ideas sweeping into China from the West, Wan ruled in a traditional manner, reviving Confucian rituals and institutions, and eventually trying to found a new imperialist dynasty. Wan's dictatorial inclinations rapidly led to clashes with Sun's party, now renamed the Guangdong, or Nationalist Party. When Wan dissolved the new parliament, the Nationalists launched a revolution. And when it failed, Sun Yat-sen fled to Japan. Wan was strong enough to brush off the challenge from the revolutionary forces, but not to turn back the clock of history. He died in 1916 and was succeeded by one of his military subordinates. For the next several years, China slipped into semi-anarchy as the power of the central government disintegrated and military warlords seized power in the provinces. In the meantime, Discontent with existing conditions continued to rise. The most vocal protest came from radical intellectuals who were convinced that political change could not take place until the Chinese people were more familiar with trends in the outside world. Braving the displeasure of Wan, intellectuals at Peking University launched the New Culture Movement in 
aimed at abolishing the remnants of the old system and introducing Western values and institutions. Through their classrooms and newly established progressive magazines and newspapers, the intellectuals introduced a host of new ideas from the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche to the feminist plays of Henrik Ibsen. Soon, educated Chinese youths were chanting, quote, down with Confucius and Sons, and talking of a new era dominated by Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. No one was a greater defender of free thought and speech than the Chancellor of Peking University, um, Tsai Yu Wanpei. And I quote, regardless of what school of thought a person may adhere to, so long as that person's ideas are justified and conform to reason and have not been passed by through the process of natural selection, although there may be controversy, such ideas have a right to be presented. Not surprisingly, such views were not appreciated by conservative army officers, one of whom threatened to lob artillery shells into the university to destroy the poisonous new ideas. Soon, however, the intellectual's discontent was joined by a growing protest against Japan's efforts to expand its influence on the mainland. Early in the 20th century, Japan had taken advantage of the Qing's decline to extend its dominance over Manchuria and Korea. In 1915, Japanese government insisted that Huan Shikai except 21 demands that would have given Japan a virtual protectorate over the Chinese government and economy. Wan was able to fend off the most far-reaching demands by arousing popular outrage in China. But at the Paris Peace Conference four years later, Japan received Germany's sphere of influence at Shandong province in reward for its support of the Allied cause in the First World War. And on hearing that the Chinese government had accepted this decision on May 4th of 1919, Patriotic students demonstrated in Beijing and other major cities. Although this May 4th movement did not lead to the restoration of Shandong to Chinese rule, it did alert the politically literate population to the threat to national survival and the incompetence of the warlord government. And so next we're going to talk about the Chinese Communist Party. By 1920, central authority had almost ceased to exist in China. Two compelling political forces now began to emerge from the chaos, Sun Yat-sen's National Party and the Chinese Communist Party. Following Lenin's strategy, Comintern agents advised the Chinese Communist Party to link up with the more experienced nationalists. Sun Yat-sen needed the experience and diplomatic support that Soviet Russia could provide because his anti-imperialist rhetoric had alienated many Western powers. In 1923, the two parties formed an alliance to oppose the warlords to drive the imperialist powers out of China. And for three years, the two parties submerged their mutual suspicions and mobilized a revolutionary army to march north and seize control of China. The so-called Northern Expedition began in the summer of 1926, and by the following spring, revolutionary forces were in control of all Chinese territory south of the Yangtze, including the major river ports of Wuhan and Shanghai. But tensions between the two parties now surfaced. Sun Yat-sen died in 1925 and was succeeded as head of the Nationalist Party by his military subordinate, Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang feigned support for the alliance with the communists, but actually planned to destroy them. In April of 1927, he struck against the communists in Shanghai, killing thousands. After the massacre, most of the Chinese communist leaders went into hiding in the city, attempting to revive the movement in its traditional base among the urban working class. Some party members, however, led by the young communist organizer Mao Zedong, fled to the hilly areas south of the Yangtze River. Unlike most Chinese communist leaders, Mao was convinced that the Chinese revolution must be based not on workers in the big cities, 
but on the impoverished peasants in the countryside. He was the son of a prosperous farmer. Mao served as an agitator in villages in his native province of Hunan during the northern expedition in 1926. And at that time, he wrote a report to the party leadership suggesting that the CCP support peasant demands for a land revolution. But his superiors refused, fearing that such radical policies would destroy the alliance with the nationalists. Now, in 1928, Chiang Kai-shek founded a new Chinese republic at Nanjing, and over the next three years, he sought to reunify China by a combination of military operations and inducements to various northern warlords to join his movement. He also attempted to put an end to the communists, rooting them out of their urban base in Shanghai and their rural redoubt in the hills of Jiangxi province. In 1931, he succeeded in forcing most party leaders to flee Shanghai from Mao's base in southern China. Three years later, Chiang's troops surrounded the communist base in Shanghai, causing Mao's People's Liberation Army to embark on the famous Long March, an arduous journey of thousands of miles to the provincial town of Yunnan in northern China. Meanwhile, Chiang was trying to build a new nation. When the Nanjing Republic was established in 1928, Chiang publicly declared his commitment to Sun Yat-sen's Three People's Principles. And in 1918, Sun had written about the all-important second stage of political tutelage. And I quote, China needs a Republican government, just as a boy needs school. As a schoolboy must have good teachers and helpful friends, so the Chinese people being for the first time under the Republican rule must have a far-sighted revolutionary government for their training. This calls for the period of political tutelage which is necessary as a transitional stage between monarchy and republicanism. Without this, disorder will be unavoidable. And in keeping with Sun's program, Chiang announced a period of political indoctrination to prepare the Chinese people for constitutional government. In the meantime, the nationalists would use their own power to carry out a land reform program and modernize the industrial sector. But it would take more than paper plans to create a new China. There were faint signs of an impending industrial revolution in the major urban centers, but most people in the countryside were drained by warlord exactions and civil strife and were still grindingly poor and overwhelmingly illiterate. A westernized urban middle class had begun to emerge and formed the natural constituency of the Nanjing government. But this new westernized elite preoccupied with individual advancement, a material accumulation, had few links with the peasants or the rickshaw drivers, quote, running in this world of suffering, in the words of a Chinese poet. Some critics dismissed Chang and his chief followers as, quote, banana Chinese, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. But aware of the difficulty in introducing exotic foreign ideas into a culturally conservative society, Chang attempted to synthesize modern Western ideas with traditional Confucian values of hard work, obedience, and moral integrity. Through the New Life Movement, sponsored by his Wellesley educated wife, Ming Sung, Chang sought to propagate traditional Confucian social ethics, such as propriety and righteousness, while rejecting what he considered the excessive individualism and material greed of Western capitalism. Unfortunately for Chang, Confucian ideas, at least in their institutional form, had been widely discredited by the failure of the traditional system to solve China's problems. With only a tenuous hold over the provinces, a growing Japanese threat in the North, and a world suffering from the Great Depression, Chang made little progress. By repressing all opposition and censoring free expression, he alienated many intellectuals and moderates. A land reform program was enacted in 1930 but had little effect. Chiang's government also made little progress in promoting industrial development. During the decade of precarious peace following the northern expedition, industrial growth averaged only about 1% annually. 
Much of the national wealth was in the hands of senior officials and close subordinates of the ruling elite. Military expenses consumed half the budget, and distressingly little was devoted to social and economic development. The new government then had little success in dealing with China's deep-seated economic and social problems. The deadly combination of internal disintegration and foreign pressure now began to coincide with the virtual down with Confucius and Sons, Economic, Social, and Cultural Change in Republican China. The transformation of the old order that had begun at the end of the Qing era continued during the early Chinese Republic. The industrial sector continued to grow, albeit slowly. Although about 75% of all industrial goods were still manually produced in the early 1930s, mechanization was beginning to replace manual labor in a number of traditional industries notably in the manufacture of textile goods. Traditional Chinese exports, such as silk and tea, were hard hit by the Great Depression, however, and manufacturing declined during the 1930s. In the countryside, farmers were often victimized by the endemic conflict and the high taxes imposed by local warlords. Social changes, Lu Zun, and the new individualism. Social changes followed shifts in the economy and the political culture. By 1915, the assault on the old system and values by educated youth was intense. The main focus of the attack was the Confucian concept of the family, in particular, filial piety and the subordination of women. Young, young people insisted on the right to choose their own mates and their own careers. Women began to demand rights and opportunities equal to those enjoyed by men. More broadly, Progressives called for an end to the concept of duty to the community and praised the Western individualist ethos. The popular short story writer Lu Zun criticized the Confucian concept of family as a, quote, man-eating system that degraded humanity. In a famous short story titled Diary of a Madman, the protagonist remarks, end quote, I remember when I was four or five years old, sitting in the cool of the hall, my brother told me that if a man's parents were ill, he should cut off a piece of his flesh and boil it for them if he wanted to be considered a good son. I've only just realized that I've been living all these years in a place where for 4,000 years they have been eating human flesh. Such criticisms did have some beneficial results. During the early Republic, the tyranny of the old family system began to decline, at least in urban areas, under the impact of economic changes and the urgings of the new culture intellectuals. Women began to escape their cloistered existence and see education and employment. Free choice in marriage became commonplace among affluent families in the cities where teenagers of westernized elites aped the clothing social habits, and even the musical taste of their contemporaries in Europe and the United States. But as a rule, the new individualism and women's rights did not penetrate to the textile factories where more than a million women worked in conditions resembling slave labor, or to the villages where traditional attitudes and customs still held sway. Arranged marriages continued to be the rule rather than the exception, and concubine, uh, concubinage remained common. According to a survey taken in the 1930s, well over two-thirds of the marriages, even among urban couples, had been arranged by their parents. A new culture, Western models. Nowhere was the struggle between traditional and modern more visible than in the area of culture. Beginning in the new culture era, radical reformists criticized traditional culture as the symbol and instrument of feudal oppression. During the 1920s and 1930s, Western literature and art became highly popular, especially among the urban middle class. Traditional culture continued to prevail among the more conservative elements, however, and some intellectuals argued for a new art that would synthesize the best of Chinese and foreign culture. But the most creative artists were interested in imitating foreign trends, while traditionalists were more concerned with preservation. Contempt for the past. Literature, in particular, was influenced by foreign ideas. Although most Chinese novels written after World War I dealt with Chinese subjects, 
They reflected the Western tendency toward social realism and often dealt with the new westernized middle class, as in Midnight by Mao Dong, which described the changing mores of Shanghai's urban elites. Another favorite theme was the disintegration <coughs> of the traditional Confucian family. Ba Jin's novel Family is an example. Most of China's modern authors displayed a clear contempt for the past. Japan Between the Wars During the first two decades of the 20th century, Japan made remarkable progress toward the creation of an advanced society on the Western model. The political system based on the Meiji con Constitution of 1890 began to evolve among Western pluralistic lines, and a multi-party system took shape. The economic and social reforms launched during the Meiji, Meiji era led to increasing prosperity and the development of a modern industrial and commercial sector. Experiment in Democracy Growth of a Multi-Party System During the first quarter of the 20th century, Japanese political parties expanded their popular following and became increasingly competitive. Individual pressure groups began to appear along with an independent press and a Bill of Rights. The influence of the old ruling oligarchy, the Genro, had not been significantly challenged. However, nor had that of its ideological foundation, the Kokutai, the Taisho democracy of the 1920s. These fragile democratic institutions were able to survive throughout the 1920s, often called the era of Taisho democracy from the reign title of the emperor. During this period, however, the military budget was reduced and the suffrage bill enacted in 1925 granted the vote to all Japanese males. Although women were still disenfranchised, many women were active in the labor movement and in campaigning for social reforms. But the era was also marked by growing social turmoil and two opposing forces within the system were gearing up to challenge the prevailing wisdom. On the left, a Marxist labor movement began to take shape in the early 1920s. On the right, ultranationalist groups called for a rejection of Western models of development and more militant approach to realizing nationalist objectives. The culture conflict between old and new indigenous and foreign, was reflected in literature. Japanese self-confidence had been restored after the victories over China and Russia and launched an age of cultural creativity in the early 20th century. Fascination with Western literature gave birth to a striking new genre called the I novel. Defying traditional Japanese reticence, some authors reveled in self-exposure with confessions of their innermost thoughts. Others found release in the proletarian literature movement of the early 1920s. Inspired by Soviet literary examples, these authors wanted literature to serve socialist goals and improve the lives of the working class. Finally, some Japanese writers blended Western psychology with Japanese sensibility in exquisite novels, reeking with nostalgia of the old Japan. One well-known example is, quote, some prefer nettles by Junichiro Tanazaki, which delicately juxtaposed the political aspect of both traditional and modern Japan. By the 1930s, however, military censorship increasingly inhibited free literary expression. A Zaibatsu economy, 12-fold increase in industrial production from 1900 to 1930. Japan also continued to make impressive progress in economic development. Spurred by rising domestic demand and continued government investment in the economy, the production of raw materials tripled from 1900 to 1930, and industrial production increased more than 12-fold. Much of the increase went into exports, and Western manufacturers began to complain about competition from the Japanese. As often happens, rapid industrialization was accompanied by some hardship and rising social tensions. In the Meiji model, various manufacturing process, processes were concentrated in, an, in a single enterprise, the Zaibatsu, or financial click. Some of these firms were existing companies that had the capital and the foresight to move into new areas. 
Others were formed by enterprising samurai who used their status and managerial experience to turn good account into new environment. Whatever their origins, these firms, often with official encouragement, developed into large conglomerates that controlled major segments of the Japanese economy. By 1937, the four largest zaibatsus, Mitsubishi, Mitsu, Sumitomo, and Yasuda, controlled 21% of the banking industry, 26% of mining, 35% of shipbuilding, 38% of commercial shipbuilding, and more than 60% of paper manufacturing and insurance. Concentration of economic power and wealth. This concentration of power and wealth in a few industrial, um, a few industries combines created problems in a Japanese society. In the first place, it resulted in the emergence of a dual economy. On one hand, a modern industry characterized by up-to-date methods and massive government subsidies. And on the other hand, a traditional manufacturing sector characterized by conservative methods and small-scale production techniques. Concentration of wealth also led to growing economic inequalities. As we have seen, economic growth had been achieved at the expense of the peasants, many of whom fled to the cities to escape rural poverty. That labor surplus benefited the industrial sector, but the urban proletariat was still poorly paid and ill-housed. A rapid increase in population. The total population of the Japanese islands increased from an estimated 43 million in 1900 to 73 million in 1940. This led to food shortages and rising unemployment. In the meantime, those left on the farm continued to suffer. As late as the beginning of World War II, an estimated one half of all Japanese farmers were tenants. Sidera Diplomacy, the search for resources and markets. A final problem for Japanese leaders in the post-Meiji era was the familiar dilemma of finding sources of raw materials and foreign markets for the nation's manufactured goods. Until World War I, Japan had dealt with the problem by seizing territories such as Taiwan, Korea, and southern Manchuria and transforming them into colonies or protectorates. That policy had begun to arouse the concern and, in some cases, the hostility of the Western nations. China was also becoming apprehensive, as we have seen. Japanese demands for Shandong province at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 aroused massive protest in China. The Washington Conference of 1922. The United States was especially concerned about Japanese aggressiveness. Although the United States had been less active than some European states in pursuing colonies in the Pacific, it had a strong interest in keeping the area open for U.S. commercial activities. In 1922, in Washington, D.C., the United States convened a major conference of nations with interest in the Pacific to discuss problems of regional security. The Washington Conference led to agreements on several issues, but the major accomplishment was a nine-power treaty recognizing the territorial integrity of China and the open door. The other participants induced China, uh, Japan to accept these provisions by accepting its special position in Manchuria. Demands for new types of resources. During the remainder of the 1920s, Japan attempted to play by the rules and laid down at the Washington Conference. Known as Siddhara Diplomacy, after the foreign minister and later prime minister who attempted to carry it out, this policy sought to achieve Japanese interest in Asia. 
through diplomatic and economic means. But this approach came under severe pressure as Japanese industrialists began to move into new areas such as chemicals, mining, and the manufacturing of appliances and automobiles. Because such industries needed resources not found in abundance locally, the Japanese government came under increasing pressure to find new sources abroad. The Rise of Militant Nationalism In the early 1930s, with the onset of the Great Depression and growing tensions in the international arena, nationalist forces rose to dominance in the Japanese government. The changes that occurred in the 1930s, which we shall discuss in Chapter 25, were not in the Constitution or the institutional structure which remained essentially intact, but in the composition and attitudes of the ruling group. Party leaders during the 1920s had attempted to realize Tokyo's aspirations within the existing global political and economic framework. Military officers and ultra-nationalist politicians who dominated the government in the 1930s were convinced that the diplomacy of the 1920s had failed and advocated a more aggressive approach to protecting national interests in a brutal and competitive world. Taisho Democracy, an Aberration? The dramatic shift in Japanese political culture that occurred in the 1930s has caused some historians to question the breadth and depth of the trend toward democratic practices in the 1920s. Was Taisho democracy merely a failed attempt at comparative liberalization in a framework dominated by the Meiji vision of empire and kokutai? Or was the militant nationalism of the 1930s an aberration brought on by the Great Depression, which caused the inexorable emergence of democracy in Japan to stall? Clearly, there's truth in both contentions. A process of democratization was taking place in Japan during the first decades of the 20th century, but without shaking the essential core of the Meiji concept of the state. When the liberal approach of the 1920s failed to solve the problems of the day, the shallow roots of democracy in Japan were exposed, and the shift toward a more aggressive approach became inevitable. Still, the course of Japanese history after World War II suggests that the emergence of multi-party democracy in the 1920s was not an aberration, but a natural consequence of evolutionary trends in Japanese society. The seeds of democracy nurtured during the Aisho era were nipped in the bud by the cataclysmic effects in, of the Great Depression. But in the more conducive climate after World War II, a democratic system, suitably adjusted to Japanese soil, reached full flower. Nationalism and Dictatorship in Latin America Although the nations of Latin America played little role in World War I, that conflict nevertheless exerted an impact on the region, especially its economy. By the end of the 1920s, the region was also strongly influenced by another event of global proportions, the Great Depression. A changing economy, export-driven economies, at the beginning of the 20th century, virtually all of Latin America, except the three islands, the Guineas, British Honduras, and some of the Caribbean islands had achieved independence. The economy of the region was based largely on the export of foodstuffs and raw materials. Some countries relied on exports of only one or two products. Argentina, for example, exported primarily beef and wheat. Chile, nitrates and copper, Brazil and the Caribbean nations, sugar, and the Central American states, bananas. A few reaped large profits from these exports, but for the majority of the population, the returns were meager. The role of the Yankee dollar, more direct foreign ownership. World War I led to a decline in European investment in Latin America and a rise in the U.S. role in the local economies. 
By the late 1920s, the United States had replaced Great Britain as the foremost source of investment in Latin America. Unlike the British, however, U.S. investors put their funds directly into production enterprises, causing large segments of the area's export industries to fall into American hands. Banana Republics and the United Fruit Company. A number of Central American states, for example, were popularly labeled banana republics because of the power and influence of the U.S.-owned United Fruit Company. American firms also dominated the copper mining industry in Chile and Peru, and the oil industry in Mexico, Peru, and Bolivia. The Effects of Dependency During the late 19th century, most governments in Latin America had been increasingly dominated by landed or military elites who controlled the mass of the population, mostly impoverished peasants, by the blatant use of military force. This trend toward authoritarianism increased during the 1930s as domestic instability caused by the effects of the Great Depression led to the creation of dictatorships throughout the region. This trend was especially evident in Argentina and Brazil, and to a lesser degree in Mexico, three countries that together possessed more than half of the land and wealth of Latin America. Argentina. Elites export beef and wheat. The political domination of Argentina by an elite minority often had disastrous effects. The Argentine government, controlled by landowners who had benefited from the export of beef and wheat, was slow to recognize the importance of establishing a local industrial base. Erogen's unsuccessful reform. In 1916, Hiploit Ipolito Irijo Yen, head of the Radical Party, was elected president on a program to improve conditions for the middle and lower classes. Little was achieved, however, as the party became increasingly corrupt and drew closer to the large landowners. Military coup in 1930. In 1930, the army overthrew Irojin's government and reestablished the power of the landed class. But their efforts to return to the previous export economy and suppress the growing influence of the labor unions failed. Brazil, Republic of Rubber and Coffee. Brazil followed a similar path. In 1889, the army replaced the Brazilian monarchy with a republic, but it was controlled by landed elites, many of whom derived their wealth from vast rubber and coffee plantations. Exports of Brazilian rubber dominated the world market until just before World War I. When it proved easier to produce rubber in Southeast Asia, however, Brazilian exports suddenly collapsed, leaving the economy of the Amazon River Basin in ruins. Getulio Vargas The coffee industry also suffered problems. In 1900, three-quarters of the world's coffee was grown in Brazil. As in Argentina, the ruling oligarchy ignored the importance of establishing an industrial urban base. When the Great Depression ravaged profits from coffee exports, a wealthy rancher, Getulio Vargas, seized power and ruled the country as president from 1930 to 1945. At first, Vargas sought to appease workers by instituting an eight-hour workday and a minimum wage, but influenced by the apparent success of fascist regimes in Europe, he ruled by increasingly autocratic means and relied on a police force that used torture to silence his opponents. His industrial policy was relatively enlightened, however, and by the end of World War II, Brazil had become Latin America's major industrial power. In 1945, the army, fearing that Vargas might prolong his power illegally after calling for new elections, forced him to resign. The Effects of Dependency 
continued. Mexico, Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. After the dictator Porfirio Diaz was ousted from power in 1910, Mexico encountered a state of turbulence that lasted for years. The ineffective leaders who followed Diaz were unable to solve the country's economic problems or bring an end to civil strife. In southern Mexico, the landless peasants responded eagerly to Emiliano Zapata when he called for agrarian reform and began to seize the haciendas of wealthy landowners. The Constitution of 1917. For the next several years, Zapata and rebel leader Pancho Villa, who operated in the northern state of Chihuahua, became an important political force by calling for measures to redress the grievances of the poor. But neither fully grasped the challenges facing the country and power eventually gravitated to a more moderate group of reformists around the Constitutional Party. They were intent on breaking the power of the great landed families and U.S. corporations, but without engaging in radical land reform or the nationalization of property. After a bloody conflict that cost the lives of thousands, the moderates consolidated power, and in 1917, they promulgated a new constitution that established a strong presidency, initiated land reform, established limits on foreign investment, and set an agenda for social welfare programs. Lazaro Cardenas, land reform. In 1920, the Constitutionalist Party leader Alvarado Obregón assumed the presidency and began to carry out his reform program. But real change did not take place until the presidency of General Lazaro Cardenas in 1934. Seizure of the Oil Industry Cardenas ordered the redistribution of 44 million acres of land controlled by landed elites, and seized control of the oil industry, which had hitherto been dominated by U.S. major oil companies, the United States, and the Good Neighbor Policy. In 1933, in a bid to improve relations with Latin American countries, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt had announced the Good Neighbor Policy, which renounced the use of U.S. military force in the region. Now, Roosevelt refused to intervene, and eventually Mexico agreed to compensate U.S. oil companies for their lost property. It then set up PEMEX, P -E -M -E -X, a governmental organization to run the oil industry. So here's a photograph of Pancho Villa uh, while he was revolting from the Spanish government. Excuse me, I said Spanish. He was an outlaw uh, to some considered a hero uh, fighting against the Mexican government uh, to uh, fight for the common people. And so here's another photograph of him. Um, he's left a controversial legacy. Uh, he was actually hunted by the United States Army for uh, the murder of eight American engineers uh, who were on board a Mexican train, um, and he was never captured. Uh, in fact, later, uh, the Mexican government reformed, uh, and some give credit to Pancho Villa uh, for these reforms. Latin American culture. Mariano Azuela, the underdogs of 1915. The first half of the 20th century witnessed a dramatic increase in literary activity in Latin America. Much of it reflected the region's ambivalent relationship with Europe and the United States. Many authors, while experimenting with imported modernist styles, also used native themes and social issues to express Latin America's unique identity. In The Underdogs, for example, Mariano Azuela presented a sympathetic but not uncritical portrait of the Mexican Revolution. 
Ricardo Galliedes, and the Guacho. Some writers extolled the region's vast virgin lands and the diversity of its peoples. In Don Segundo Sombra, Ricardo Garriedes celebrated the life of the gaucho, or cowboy, defining Argentina's hope and strength as the enlightened management of its fertile earth. Romulo Gallegos and Venezuela. In Dona Barbara, Romulo Gallegos wrote in a similar vein about his native Venezuela. Other authors pursued the theme of solitude and detachment, reflecting the region's physical separation from the rest of the world. Modernism, nationalism, and politics. The murals of Diego Rivera. Latin American artists followed their literary counterparts in joining the modernist movement in Europe. Yet they too were eager to celebrate the emergence of a new regional and national essence. In Mexico, where the government provided financial support for painting murals on public buildings, the artist Diego Rivera began to produce a monumental style of mural art that served two purses to illustrate the national past by portraying Aztec legends and folk customs, and to popularize a political message in favor of realizing the social goals of the Mexican Revolution. The paintings of Frida Kahlo, his wife, Frida Kahlo, incorporated surrealist whimsy in her own paintings, many of which were portraits of herself and her family.